Some think that Christmas comes for a select few. For those without problems, with no reason to boo-hoo. Not so, say the Who's, why Christmas is a time for one and all. To sing and remember who was born in a humble manger stall. Not just the gift for the wealthy, the mighty, the strong. But hope for the simple, the outcast to finally belong. As the weather turns and it starts to freeze slick, keep an eye out for the Grinch. He might pop up real quick. So what happens next? Well, in Whoville, they say, your heart might grow up to three sizes in one day. Please join us this season as we stand hand in hand to welcome Christmas with great joy and festivities planned. I love that worship set that we just had as this, this song thread, that this idea thread of like God being quiet and us hearkening back to his names of the Lion of Judah. And when um, we think it's quiet and we think it's dark and we think it's low, but that lion has a roar. Like when in our lives when we think things are quiet and you think things are broken and you think God has left you, he continues to be a God that says, they may think it looks dark, but I got a roar. And I just love that idea. Now, during the, after the first service, the camera guys asked me to stop moving around as much. My simple answer to them was, I'm taking off my flannel and my glasses, and no, I will not stop moving around as much. So I hope you will match the energy with me and have some fun with this. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. If you're watching at home online, would you put some uh, Christmas emojis into the chat? I don't want you to feel like you're, um, you're, I want you to be connected. Let me say that. I want you to be connected throughout the service. I don't want you to feel like you are left, you know, home alone. <laughs> I love it when I can throw loans. We got it. Uh, if, you're, if you're sitting here in service, why don't you uh, give the person around you a little high five, a little hug, a little Merry Christmas to them. This is our last Sunday service before Christmas Eve. Where has the Christmas season gone? And if that person is texting on their phone and refusing to say Merry Christmas, you just smooch them on the cheek. Merry Christmas to you. All right, the Christmas, Christmas season is just an amazing time to be at church. Church is a community place. Church is a together place. But you know, life and the Christmas season can be really hard alone. They can be really hard alone. And that's because our bodies are not designed to be alone. When we're with other people, y'all, we naturally, like you perk up, you sit differently, your voice has a different tone, even without you thinking about it. Your eyebrows, your lips, your nose, they respond differently when there's other people around, whether you're conscious of it or not. We are people who need people. And whether you're an introvert like me, and I am an introvert, I like my space. That is the number one thing I got after the last, last message was, an introvert, really? And that's what people come up to me saying. If you're an introvert like me or maybe an extrovert like Pastor Adam who just hugs people at the drop of a dime or, or you know, just needs people around, all of us need people, right? We are physiologically designed as people who need people. Right? And in the book of Genesis, I see this, uh, I see like two examples of this right away that prove this to me. And the first is when God is talking and he says, uh, let us make man in our image. Are you tracking with those two words there? Let us make man in. Oh, look at you. I did the teacher point thing to the, and you guys got it the first time. Let us make man in our image. And what that means is from the start, from the origin God was not alone. We believe that God is one God, but we believe that God is also made up of three parts. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They live together in one community, one, right? So God himself, who made us in his image, is not alone from the start. And the other thing that I see in our origin story, after God makes everything, and after he makes us, and he looks back and goes... Mm, that's very good, right? He says that to us. He says, there's something missing. I assume he did like a toe tap thing. He's like, mm. Jesus, what do you think? 
Ooh, I got it. I got it. The Lord said, it isn't good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. Because it's not good for us to be alone. Now, today is not a sermon on being alone. But I did want to remind you during this Christmas season to make sure that you don't isolate yourself. To make sure that you're not letting others isolate themselves. Like, we may think this is a big, joyous time of the year, but this is a time of the year when a lot of people kind of shrink in, when a lot of people will hide out, when people are looking for a connection and they're not really finding it, right? They feel isolated in some ways. And sometimes we isolate people during the Christmas season for fear of the way the relationship used to be, and we're worried it's going to pop up that way again. You're like, this is my Christmas season. I ain't letting them do that around here. Or sometimes there might be some unforgiveness between the two of you that is causing some isolation, some separation, some I'm not, I don't want you around me during this holiday season. And I just want to ask you, like, that's not how we're designed to be. You are not designed to be alone. You're not designed to hide out. You're not designed to just sit there by yourself. This Wednesday at youth group, we actually have a Christmas party. Um, it is for, so if you are a middle schooler or a high schooler, consider this my invite to you. Please do not let church hurt or what you think you hear about God or what you think you hear about what youth group is keep you in isolation. Our regular attenders, our, our, our regular youth, they're looking for their families, they're looking at their friends, they're looking at neighbors, like, who am I going to invite? It's a party. Like, we're going to party, and if you don't know how youth group parties, then there will be stickiness, and there will be grossness, and it will be a lot of fun. I kind of am looking forward to it more than our staff party. So, I don't, I don't, although Julio cooked for our staff party, so I am stoked about that. All right. Here in the grown-up church, in the big people church, which is where you are right now, we have Christmas Eve services for you next Saturday at 3 o'clock, at 5 o'clock, and at 7 o'clock. They're going to be fun services, but they'll also have that nostalgic, awesome candlelight, like, traditional vibe to them. So you've got a place to invite people. You've got a place to make sure isolation doesn't happen. You've got a place to make sure connection can happen. You've got a, a place to make sure that folks are not left home alone. Okay, let's talk who's. Can we talk who's? Did you guys see the who's? If you were at home, you missed out. There are some who's walking these hallways right now. They look amazing. They're bringing some Christmas joy and some Christmas spirit. When Pastor Adam was planning this and we, he was talking through this with us and we sit down in a little planning meeting back in September and he's talking through what, what he wants this, this season to look like, he has this, this weird idea and he says, uh, I don't, I don't want to focus it on the Grinch. And I'm like, the Grinch, you mean like the only interesting character in the whole cartoon? You mean the Grinch, the only one with actual lines in the cartoon? You mean the Grinch who goes through a dramatic life change, exactly what we want people in the Christian faith to do? You don't want to focus in on that character? Sure, boss, that sounds great. And inside my head, I'm going, what are you thinking? Like, I'm not tracking at all. Okay, and then we watched this clip. He pointed this out to me. I want you to see this and see if you can kind of track where he was. Now that his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light. With a smile in his soul, he descended Mount Crumpet, cheerily blowing hoo-hoo on his trumpet. He rode into Whoville, he brought back their toys, he brought back their floof to the Who girls and boys. He brought back their snoop and their tringlers and fuzzles. Brought back their pantukas, their dafflers and wuzzles. He brought everything back, all the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. It's not just that the Who's came together in that kind of cute little circle thing around where their, their uh, tree used to be and they start singing together. It's not that they were not focused on the material gifts. It's that moment when the, um, they let the Grinch right back in. Did you catch that moment right at the end? The circle opens up. He slides right back in. It's at that moment that I was like, oh. I see you, Pastor Adam. That's the moment when I was like, okay, let's focus in on the who's. I mean, look, there's no way 
that as he's coming down that mountain trumpeting, that the Who's are like, oh, look, he's coming back to spend some good Christmas time with us. He just robbed them blind in the most evil of ways. Right? There is no, like, there could be, like, he could be coming down to, like, mock them, taunt them. I mean, honestly, he could be coming down to set their presence on fire in front of them. Like, we don't know. Like, the Grinch has been evil up to this point. I mean, they wouldn't even touch him with a 39 and a half foot pole. Some compared him to a seasick crocodile. I mean, they said, like, he's as charming as an eel. And some even, you will not believe this, but they even compared him to a bad banana with a greasy black peel. <laughs> like, that's who the who's knew. That's who they knew. That's who the Grinch was in their eyes. Before he came down and said, my bad, I'm sorry, I've had a change of heart. Please forgive me. They opened that circle up and let him back in. Like, come on, who's? Why you got to be so Jesus-y? Like, what is that? Why can't they be like the rest of us and just post about them passive-aggressively on Facebook? Right? Why can't, why can't they do that? Why can't they just kind of roll their eyes and in that little who circle kind of do some side gossiping? And then, like, him and his big heart. I mean, he's not even giving them gifts. He's literally just giving back what he stole. Right? Your little kid takes something. What's the first thing you do? Give it back. Give it back. These are the basics of when you're caught doing something wrong. He's, he's not giving his own gifts. And then he gets to cut the roast beast at the end like he's some hero? Like, what in the world? So, I think not focusing on the Grinch is a pretty smart idea because I think I'd like some who level of forgiveness, right? I mean, are we tracking with that? Like, I want to be able to do that. Now, I've heard... Many people say this quote in many different ways, and I assume they've lived terrible lives because it's a terrifying quote. But they say, um, keeping unforgiveness, not giving forgiveness, is like trying to kill someone. I've not done that, but a lot of people have because this quote's around there a lot. Um, but you swallowing the poison. Like you're swallowing the poison because it hurts Unforgiveness hurts us. Unforgiveness hurts you. Right? They don't know that you're that upset. They don't know that you're that mad. Like you're walking around like your day's all cranky and they're posting on Facebook with their who glasses on about getting hot cocoa down at the promenade. Like, no, I'm mad at you. No, you hurt me. Like, and, it's, and I think most of us would say like, okay, you know what? This forgiveness thing, I shouldn't be holding on to it. It's probably better for me to forgive people. But you know what? No. It's hard. I don't want to. So I was listening to uh, Pastor Tim Keller talk about forgiveness, and he said, um, he had three points, and each one of them he was saying, I went like, yes, that is me. So I wanted to share these with you. Let's see if you track with me. He said, we think that if I forgive them, if I forgive people, it makes light of what they did. Right? We think they've gotten away with it. Right? They'll think it's okay. No, there's got to be some consequences here, right? And I was like, oh, yes, that's exactly what I think. That is hard to hear. Then he said, um, we think, you know, we say we'll forgive them if they come to us and they say they're sorry and they really mean it and they show me that they mean it. And I was like, oh, I've actually said that. Like, I've really, you know... And, and then he said, you know, sometimes we do forgive. We say we forgive, but then we add this on to the end of it. But I will not forget. Mm. And then you walk away with this thing. Yes, you do. Seeing each one of you. So I'm sitting this week. I got to go to the elementary school and see my daughter Molly um, at a little writing project they had. We're all sitting in the cafeteria, and all the parents and, and family members, you can kind of walk around and see the different uh, books that the kids have written. So I'm sitting at the table with Molly, and one of my friends comes by. His name's Jimmy. I taught him in fifth grade. He's just the, the coolest kid. And he and I are chatting, and on one of the other kids at the table, he says, um, he says, wow, what grade are you in? And Jimmy tells him ninth, and for some reason that blows this kid's mind. I don't know why. Like, we need to get some bigger kids around this guy because ninth. So he decides to test Jimmy. And what he thinks is an extremely complicated math problem. 
He says, yeah. So it's 128 plus 128. Is it like 150 or something? And Jimmy turns to him instantly, instantly, and goes, it's 256. And the kid, the kid looks, the kid does this. He goes, that's a lot. How did you know that? Now, some of you might know 256 is one, because these used to be file storage sizes. 128, 256 was a 512. So maybe you know that progression. But I've known Jimmy a while and know that's not what Jimmy did. So I said, Jimmy. It was this fun teacher moment in my head. I was like, oh, I can't wait for this. Jimmy, tell me what you did. Tell me what you did. And Jimmy said, well, 128 is close to 130, and 130 plus 130 is 260, and that's pretty easy to do. And since I just added two on to each one, I just know I need to back off four from 260, and that makes it 256. So why does that story matter to you? Why does that story matter? Well, there's an instance in Scripture when Jesus is asked, how much do I have to forgive? Seven times enough? Is it? And Jesus replies, not just seven. But 77 times. And if you want, you can take that as just straight 77 times. Or I've heard some people preach and say that it's actually seven times 77 is what Jesus was saying. Which would, you know, if you take the 77 and you move it up to 80. And you go 80 times 7, which would be 560. And then you back down the 7 times the 3, which would be 21. That gets you 539. That's what Jimmy would say if you were here. So either way, whether it's 77 times or it's 539 times. The idea is not the specific number, right? Peter, who asked, and all the other people who were around there, when they would have heard him answer, they would have been like that little kid talking to Jimmy. They would have just gone, that's a lot. Like, that's what they would have done, right? And the idea being, we're not tracking how much we forgive someone. So, so how, how, how much do we forgive people? A lot, right? The answer is a lot. I mean, you need it a lot. And I need it a lot, right? And God knows that we need it a lot. So God made a plan for us. God made a plan. And that plan we actually celebrate during this Christmas season. So let's take a look at that plan. Let's take a look at what we celebrate. I'm going to read to you from the Gospel of Matthew today. It's a little bit of the Christmas story. And I've been reading out of the contemporary English version. So if this doesn't track with the, exactly the way that you have it memorized, which I know some of you do. Um, there's one giggle in the front row there. She's like, I do. That's <laughs> right. Whoever that was. I don't know. I don't know who that was. Um, but we're going to put it up on the screen so you can follow along here. And I want you listening to this and looking at this with a forgiveness lens with a forgiveness lens. This is how Jesus Christ was born. A young woman named Mary was engaged to Joseph from King David's family. But before they were married, she learned she was going to have a, a baby by God's Holy Spirit. Joseph was a good man and did not want to embarrass Mary in front of them, so he decided to call off the wedding quickly. Now, there's more to the story, and I want to get to the rest of it, but I, I absolutely need to pause right here because I see this act of forgiveness from Joseph that, honestly, I hadn't seen in previous years that you know, Mary has just kind of ruined their life, right? Like, the, what they had planned, what they were going to do, like, what the, how things were going to go is completely gone now for Joseph. And he's being kind and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass her, but she has jacked his life. Like, this is not what it was supposed to be. He could always be that guy. Right? And honestly, it might not even be very safe for him. He's most likely the person to have gotten her pregnant before marriage, in all honesty. Right? So if, she, if he's just going to let her go off being pregnant, like, that could be bad. This is an act of forgiveness from Joseph. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Verse 20. It says, while Joseph was Thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream. The angel said, Joseph, the baby that Mary will have is from the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and marry her. Then after the baby is born, name him Jesus. Jesus. Name him Jesus. Because, because he will save his people from their sins. Because he will save his people from their sins. In this little 
this part of the Christmas story that we, I don't know, we read a lot or we gloss over a lot. And maybe some people read it as part of a tradition. Like we get this act of kindness from Joseph, but we also get to see the character of God and the purpose of Jesus. Like the actual purpose of Jesus coming here. It's right there in the Christmas story. Like I'm going to be honest with you, I kind of never tracked it in black. Like it's clear. It's in black and white right there. His purpose is to save his people from their sins. I mean, that means he wants to make things right for you so that you can have a relationship with God again. That's what he's looking for. Forgiveness is so the character of Jesus that it's built into his name, right, that, that he carries on with him his whole life, that we cry out and we sing all the time, right? It's, it's, it's at his birth. And then later you move him forward to the cross right before he, he, he dies an undeserved death. One of the last things he says from the cross is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Like, forgiveness is just wrapped all around Jesus. This, this all hail King Jesus, what is wrapping around our king? It's forgiveness for us. What in the world? That's amazing. That's amazing. That's something I think the world doesn't know and doesn't realize when they look at the church. That they say, my king, his life is wrapped in forgiveness. Right? Now, I just wanted to make sure you are tracking with the idea that as we celebrate that Jesus was born, that we remember and we understand why Jesus was born. Right? We're going to celebrate that Jesus was born. I mean, just look at those boys. We are definitely celebrating, right? But to remember why Jesus was born. Now, there are two things happening here with forgiveness, and they're both the same-ish. They're both the same-ish. Let me start by needing to forgive other people because that's always an easier place to start, right, talking about forgiving on the uh, other folks as opposed to cleaning up what's going on inside of here. So the first thing I want to talk about is forgiving them when they've done wrong to you, when they lied about you behind your back. When they say one thing to you and, and something else to your close friend, when um, they're acting an absolute fool and somehow they try to blame it on you and they pull that back to you, when they raise their voice to you, maybe they're a family member or a friend and they have like experiences with you and they know the things that hurt you and then they kind of throw one of those out there passive aggressively at you, right? Why don't we talk about how they um, forgive them for selfishly wasting money on themselves, when you were supposed to tithe, you were supposed to give, you wanted to help other people, and what do they do? They keep going out and wasting money. Right? They should be helping you with the kids. Maybe there's forgiveness there that needs to happen. Maybe it's at work and they keep leaving early. Or they're decorating when you're trying to get projects done. Right? And, and they, all of a sudden you're left with extra things to do. Maybe they don't text you back quick enough, or maybe they leave you on red. Um, I had to explain to the 9 o'clock service what that means. Right? You can see on your phone, you can see, I can see that you read my text. Right? It literally tells me red, R-E-A-D. It says that you read it. Why haven't you texted me back? Oh, you got other things to do? Because I see you posting online. Right? I see you posting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. hmm. And then that kind of builds this anger in me. I don't know what it is. Like, I got some issues with you. Or they leave those three little dots there. Like, they're pretending to text you. I'll get back to you really quick. No, they will not. Let's talk a little heavier, shall we? Let's talk about you getting fired when you didn't deserve it. That happens and has happened to people in this church, to people that I know, the people that I care about. Let's talk about the unfair standards that you had growing up or maybe that you have in your household right now with your partner or your family members. Let's talk about money that they legitimately stole from you with no intention of giving it back to you. Let's talk about how they're unwilling to help you. Let's talk about maybe that man that put his hands on you. Let's talk about maybe that spouse who cheated on you, that person in the car that took something from you that you will never get back. That from here on out, every breath that you take in your life will now be different because of that person. Every night you go to bed, it's different. Every cup of coffee you have in the morning is now different. 
Every time you go to work, every holiday you have will now be different because of that person. Let's talk there. Whether you got a list of 77 or you got a list of 539, you know what Jesus says? You got to forgive a lot. I am sorry. I am sorry. And I know what you're thinking because I'm thinking it too. Like I know people in these stories. I know people in these situations. I've been part of these stories and these situations. And forgiving is hard. It is hard. Like I want to say like, Jesus, you forgive them fine. Please. You are my savior. You do it. I can't. Right? Forgiving them is letting them off free. I can't do that. But it's not. It's not letting them off free. Can I, I tell you that by actually forgiving them, you're actually acknowledging the hurt. You're actually acknowledging that they did something wrong. I mean, if there wasn't anything wrong there, then you wouldn't actually be forgiving. If you're forgiving, that means that something is wrong. Right? If, you're, if Jesus comes and says, I'm here to forgive you, do you know what that means? That there is something wrong. That there is hurt. That there is sin. That there is brokenness. That there is lying. That there's something somewhere. When you forgive others, you legitimately are acknowledging, you done messed up. You hurt me. That was not okay. It can't be forgiveness if there's not a wrong that is connected to it. The second thing I want you to track with here is that you need forgiveness. A lot. And I need forgiveness. How much? A lot. A lot. Yes, a lot. Especially if we are someone, especially if we are a church who claims to know Jesus, who claims to follow Jesus, who claims all hail King Jesus, right? Because the angel said, he will be named Jesus because he will save his people from their, from their sins. From their sins. He will be named Jesus because he will save the people from their sins by dying for them. By dying for them. When you ask God for forgiveness, he's not shaming you and going, ha, 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 gotcha, found it, found it. It is just you saying, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. When you ask for forgiveness, when you talk to him and you confess it, you're just saying, I need Jesus. Right? And we say that all the time. We say that I need Jesus part all the time. But I, do we say it with the first part connected to it? Do we say it after and as part of confessing and giving up what we're holding on to? I always feel like a workplace filled with Christians should be a different workplace. You're walking into work. We're not those people who say, who make that excuse for why that email didn't get sent or kind of twist it around a little bit as to how you missed that meeting. We're those people that say, my bad. We're those people that say, oh, I'm sorry. That puts you in a tough spot. How can I help? We're those people that say, I completely slipped on that and let me make it right. I'm sorry. We're those I'm sorry people. We're those I'm, my bad people. Like we're those forgiveness people. And we're those people when someone does that to us that we say, yeah, no problem. Let's get it done. Let's fix it together. Right? That is acknowledging the need for Jesus. That is acknowledging living a life for Jesus. Now, in our closing moments here, I want to read you a parable from Jesus. It's in the Gospel of Matthew, if you want to go and take a look at it later. It's, Jesus says this. One day, a king decided to call his officials and ask them to give an account for what they owed him. And unfortunately, we will have to do this. We will stand in front of God and give an account. We will give an account. And as he was doing this, one official was brought in who owed him 50 million silver coins. But he didn't have any money to pay what he owed. 
the king ordered him to be sold along with his wife and children and all he owned in order to pay his debts. Hmm. The official got down on his knees and began begging, have pity on me. I will pay you every cent that I owe. Verse 27 says the king felt sorry for him and let him go free. And this is, this is the best part here. He even told the official he did not have to pay back the money. Yo, it is super easy to look at others and think like, oh, thank you, Lord, that you forgive people because she really needs it. Right? It's really easy to think that, to look at others and believe that. It's really easy for us to pass over ourselves. It's really easy to pass over the things that we talk about, the things that we text, the things that we watch, maybe the hurtful, mean things that we say to, to people that we love, people that have been entrusted to us to take care of. I'd like you, I'd like to ask you, let me say that, I'd like to ask you today to do what was modeled for us in that passage. I'd like you to ask for forgiveness for yourselves. I'm not telling you to get on your knees and grovel over the, if that's where you want to be, then that's where God's calling you to be. I'm just asking you to ask. I'm just asking you to be real about it. I'm just asking you to ask. Ask Jesus to forgive you for anything that has separated him from you. Whether those are things that everybody sees and that you just kind of have fun with, whether there's things that you're hiding in the dark, whether the things maybe you don't even know that they're separating you from Him. Whatever those things are, when I pray, it's, it's often a great prayer to just say, God, and, and anything else that's separating me from you, I'm sorry, because that's not my intention. I want to be close to you. Forgive me for those things that I don't know. There's, like, I am just a man. I'm just a creation. So I don't know. We're a church here celebrating Christmas, celebrating the coming of the King. All hail King Jesus, a King whose purpose was to forgive. And if we're going to celebrate that, we need to accept why He came. Right? Now I'm going to ask you to do one more thing here. I'm going to ask you to forgive others this holiday season second part of the parable it says this but as the official was leaving he happened to meet another official who owed him 100 silver coins so he grabbed the man by the throat he started choking him and said pay me what you owe me the man got down on his knees and began begging have pity on me and I will pay you back but the first official refused to have pity. Instead, he went and had the other official put in jail until he could pay what he owed. When some other officials found out what had happened, they felt sorry for the man who had been put in jail, and they told the king what had happened. And the king called the first official back and said, You were an evil man. When you begged for mercy, I said you did not have to pay back a cent. Don't you think you should show pity to someone else? as I do you. Don't you think that you should show pity, that you should show grace, that you should show forgiveness, that you should show peace, that you should show Jesus to someone else as it's been given to you? The king was so angry that he ordered the official to be tortured until he could pay back everything he owed, which would be never, which would be never. That is how my Father in heaven will treat you if you don't forgive each of his followers with all of your heart. If we accept Jesus, if we celebrate Jesus, if we sing the candlelight service, put up the beautiful trees, and we say things like he is the reason for the season, then we need to celebrate why he came. We need to accept why he came. He came to forgive. He came to forgive, which also means that we have no right in God's eyes. We have no right in God's eyes, in God's kingdom, to hold unforgiveness over someone else. 
I am not saying it's hard. It's easy, church. I am not saying it's easy. I am not making light of this. I am not. But I am saying there is a king, and his purpose was to handle this. We're saying and we believe and we're learning that he is the king above all kings, and this is his purpose, then he can handle this. This is what he's here for. He can handle this. And I'm also saying to you where we started. You have a community. We were made for community. We were made for each other. We were made to be around other people. You don't feel like you can handle it by yourself? You weren't meant to handle things by yourself. Careful not to isolate. Look for those who are isolating. Make sure people have connections. Make sure people have invites. Be there. Be willing. Would you stand with me? I'd like to pray for you as we get ready to head out. And you get ready to go do some damage this week. In Jesus' name. Bow your heads. Close your eyes, please. God, I pray that we don't let unforgiveness stop us from fully enjoying this Christmas season, from fully enjoying the gift of your son, from fully enjoying the gift of each other. God, I pray that we don't let unforgiveness get in the way of what you have planned. God, and I do pray that you call to mind what we individually keep hiding what we individually need to turn from, need to repent from, need to say I'm sorry for. Call that to mind and let us give it to you. Let us give it to you. You came with a purpose and we are your people. We want to be part of that purpose. All God's people said, amen, amen. Church, who level forgiveness? That's what we're heading into the world of running through our minds. Who level forgiveness? If you don't have another pair of who glasses, if you lost yours, or you want some extra, or you just want to remind yourself over and over again, I'm going to wear these all the time, so I'm going to be who level. We have extras out there. Take them. Empty that basket. Who level forgiveness? Take them. And maybe you take a little picture, a little selfie with the who's out there. Like, they are out there, and you're like, hey, how did you forgive with them Grinches? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, go talk to them. Take some pictures. Enjoy the community. I will see you on Saturday, won't I? Christmas Eve at 3, at 5, or at 7. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you. I can't. Merry Christmas. Thank you. All right. I'll see you next Saturday.